It was a very powerful example of a 10-year-old rock giving an age of 2.8 million years. It exposes the impossibility of using modern measurements now to be able to date something in the past. Mount St. Helens has got a lot of evidences that geology can happen quickly. That canyon was carved in less than a day, and it was due to Mount St. Helens erupting. On a personal note, Taz, have you found much pushback as a geologist yourself when you talk about the things that you believe? Well, we're talking about how does a 10-year-old rock get dated at 2 million years old? I'm here with Dr. Tasman Walker from Creation Ministries International. Taz, you've been to Mount St. Helens. What does this place have to do with rock dating? Well, it has to do with the 10-year-old rock that was dated at millions of years old. And the Mount St. Helens is a very, very famous volcano mm -hmm. and it erupted in 1980. It's on the... Uh, it's on the west coast of the United States of America, towards okay. the north of the states, and uh, it's it's very close to C uh, Seattle, also close to Portland in there. And uh, when it exploded in 1980, there were 57 people died in that explosion. Mm -hmm. Pretty tragic. The worst yeah. disaster that's happened in the U.S. Uh, in, in its history. But the thing about Mount St. Helens is that it allowed, when the new lava dome started to form, it, we know when it happened, and so we're able to test whether the methods that are used for dating rocks, whether they are accurate, whether they really work. And there were some very interesting results came out of that. Okay, now new lava dome, what do you mean by that? Can you give me a picture? Well, so the, 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 the uh, Mount St. Helens had a traditional, really attractive point on the mountains. And uh, when it exploded, the, the hundreds and hundreds of metres at the top got blasted off mm -hmm. and it left a great big hollow in the, in the mountain. Okay. And then the lava built up as a great big dome, great big blob of lava. And so that lava dome was enabled people to be able to check what does it, what does it measure. If we do a radioactive date on it, mm -hmm. does it give the right answer? And it was 10 years old when the rock was collected and it was sent off to the laboratories to be tested. Okay, and so as they were doing this testing, what have they come up with? Well, the guy that collected the rock, he, he did some very interesting checks. It's a, they used a normal method, which is um, it's called potassium argon, and it's widely used okay. in all dating of rocks, and there's a reason for that. It's believed that argon is a gas which escapes from the rock when the rock is molten, and so uh, it enables us to, to sort of overcome one of the major problems with, with any sort of dating method. Mm -hmm. And so when St. Mount St. Helens exploded, the lava dome built up, and a guy called Dr. Stephen Austin collected samples of the rock and uh, he, he just did the normal sort of dating processes. Okay. So w what they do is they crush the rock up and they send uh, a sample of that crushed rock off to the laboratory and the laboratory does the normal sorts of dating tests. And uh, what Stephen Austin did is he picked a little sample of a certain mineral out of the rock, a, a light-coloured mineral, called Amphibol, and he sent a sample of that off to the laboratory. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did another sample of a black coloured mineral and sent that off. So he had numbers of different samples to the laboratory and he wanted to see what the answer would be. Okay. And it came back, it uh, was very, uh, really very uh, enlightening as to what it was. When he sent them off, does he tell the laboratory um, where it's come from, what's happened to it and exactly when it was formed? I can't remember if he told them exactly that in this case. Often that is required right. so, so that the laboratory knows the ballpark of where, what sort of date to expect and uh, how to calibrate and how to adjust their instruments. Okay. But uh, he probably told them that he expected very little argon. You see, the dating method depends on the radioactive decay of potassium into this argon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you can make very accurate measurements in the present. Mm -hmm. uh, but every dating method has the same problem, is that you can't go back in time to make measurements in the past. And so geologists, they make great, great measurements now, but they don't know what it was in the past, and they need to know that to be able to calculate a date. 
It's like uh, if you're using a, uh, a stopwatch mm -hmm. and uh, you need to start it, you yep. know, when it started and you need to stop it. But if you didn't start it or read the clock at the beginning, mm -hmm. you can't know how long it was if you read the clock at the end. So that's the way they did it. Okay. But they're all saying that they have these really accurate dates, even though they're not able to go back. Are they making assumptions? Uh, well, I could call it a guess. They're okay. making a guess about what it was. Well, how, how else are you going to do it? Mm. We need a number. Mm. And uh, so in this particular case, uh, what they do is they assume that there was no argon in the rock when it formed. We know that that, uh, that assumption is not exactly right. But how would you know? So mm. you, you don't know if, if there's been any gained or any lost. You don't know what was there really at the beginning. It's just a big assumption that can never be tested. And so that's what uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Austin was doing. He was doing a check on this mm. uh, just to really... Uh, exposed to see if there's a you know if there's a problem with it, mm. and that's what happened. It was uh, ten years from the explosion when this lava dome came up was when they actually uh, took the sample mm -hmm. and sent it off to the laboratory, and it should have given an age of basically argon undetectable or you know minimal argon. They should have been able to give a a mm. uh, a really really low indicator. It was a really really low date. Too too hard to measure it. So mm. it's so low. But as a matter of fact, that when they sent the the the, the uh, crushed whole rock, all the rock crushed together, sent that off. It came back with an age of three hundred and fifty thousand years. So that's fairly low. Uh, but <laughs> and but they gave a. Fairly low. It's not millions of years, but yes. it's much more than uh, ten years. <laughs> ten years, much more than ten years, but it's fairly low as far as argon uh, argon dating is concerned. Mm. And uh, so that was a, that was the date. And uh, if the person hadn't seen it explode and didn't know what the age was, it, the, the, they would have just accepted three hundred and fifty thousand years. That's the the age of it. But what happened was uh, they tested the second sample of the amphibole mm -hmm. and that came back with an age of 900,000 years. So you got 350,000, 900,000. And so you can say, well, which one is right? And then the third sample of the pyroxene came back with an age of 2.8 million years old. And so that's the 10-year-old rock gave an age of over 2 million years. And so that's what happened. So hang on, they've got three samples from the same rock. Same rock. But they're giving it such different dates. That's right. That's exactly right. But, you know, what happens is that uh, in, in radioactive dating, they, they, they just like that, they, they do the analysis and it's quite a uh, complicated, exact analysis to get an exact calculation. Mm -hmm. And then when they get an answer, nobody believes the answer unless it fits with what they think it should be. And what do they think it should be? Well, they make up a story. They, they didn't know. if they, When they look at the number 350,000, they would think, Mm, that looks all right. Or, or they'd ask the geologist, is this all right? Is this what you're expecting? And, the ge and so the geologist would say, well, no, actually, I was expecting it to be older. They'd say, oh, there must be some loss of argon that's occurred here. And so they would make up a story then mm -hmm. to be able to, uh, to s explain why the date came out the way it did mm -hmm. and not uh, as, as was expected. So every date is got an interpretation, they call it, connected with it uh, to explain why it is what it is. So in the case of Mount St. Helens, you got these three dates. Mm -hmm. They came back with 350,000, 900,000, 2.8 million. And uh, I always like to say, what date would you like? <laughs> and that's exactly the way it goes. What date would you like? Mm. Which is really cool. Mm. So they've got these three different dates. It's looking like this is based on some assumptions, how are they, how do they then decide with those three dates what's what's right and what's not and where do they go from here? So it all goes, comes into the interpretation mm. of, as to how it's interpreted. And uh, there was one guy who was a, a, a world famous as far as looking at uh, radioactive dating and they're called radioactive isotopes and isotope geochemistry and that sort of thing. And he said, there's, there's no such thing as a bad date. It's just a bad interpretation. 
Wow. So it's impossible to get a wrong date because it's, you just simply interpret mm. it to, to fit in with what you think it should be. Mm. And uh, geologists, they, 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 they look around at the rocks and, and uh, the, uh, what rocks, how they're related to each other, mm-hmm. and they can work out the relative order of, of the rocks. They know that this one is younger than this one mm-hmm. and uh, they, they can work out the relative dating and that's, you know, that's pretty reliable. If you can actually see the rocks uh, in the landscape, it's pretty reliable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so any radioactive date has to fit in with the order that's expected and if it's outside of that, then there's an explanation comes up. Sometimes they put it in the paper. Why? Sometimes they just just leave it out altogether. And when I was at the university, uh, the um, and I stud- studying radioactive dating, the uh, my, my supervisor said I'd love to have you come and work for me. He says because you don't just accept things, you know, and take things for what it's what it's written. He said I've got all these mm. dates which I can't figure out where they fit in, <laughs> and I'd like you to have a look at them. Mm. So that was I thought that was really cool. Mm. So, so it sounds like there's a big picture that they've got to fit their dates into. Exactly right. Exactly right. Taz, can, they, can we go back and actually get an accurate date? Can we measure exactly? Well, that's the first thing is that it's actually impossible. To, there's no instrument that can actually measure the date of something. Just by measuring uh, dates in the present, measuring things in the present, there's nothing that is around that can measure the date of anything because you have to know what be able to make measurements when it formed, and you have to know whether there's been any disturbance to this thing or, uh, since, since it formed and since you're making the, measure, the measurements. Mm-hmm. So basically all dates are based on assumptions and the fact is you can get any date you like depending on the assumptions you make. But it's a very, very important method to give credibility to the system. That's why that why geologists like it okay. is that it, it it they present the dates as you know three uh, they might have a date of something like say five hundred million years mm-hmm. plus or minus three million years, mm-hmm. and so this plus or minus gives the impression that it's really precise. Mm. Uh, but all that indicates is that we measured things precisely. Mm. It doesn't indicate whether the date is precise or not. Mm. And as a matter of fact, us- usually they're not. So it's interesting, this work that Stephen Austin did mm. on Mount St. Helens, mm-hmm. and he published the paper, he, he was very... Um, he looked at the examples and he, he, he described what he did and he explained where he collected the rocks from and, and, and uh, where they fitted into the, the order, the order of the, of the things that happened. Yeah. He did all that and the uh, measurements that he made and the chemical analysis and he went through the whole detail of it and he produced these results which were quite devastating. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there's been a lot of pushback against him. That's what I was going to ask. How's this been received? It's uh, not been received very well mm. because um, and people have thrown up basically these interpretations as an excuse and say uh, for it and so one of the things they say is that say, you know they, they attack them the, the, uh, they attack the man and mm. say that Stephen Austin is incompetent he doesn't know what he's doing. He should never have sent those rocks off to the laboratory because he knew that they were young and he, he knows that this potassium argon method only works on rocks that are millions of years old. And so he should never have sent the rocks to the laboratory in the first place. And, uh, and the answer to that is, well, the laboratory detected the argon in the rock and they were a- detected it. they were able to give a plus or minus age on it and so there was certainly plenty of argon in the rock. So even though it was young, it certainly had enough argon that, that enabled it to be uh, analysed correctly. Yeah. Okay. So that was one. One. Mm-hmm. So What else? Well, the first one there said he didn't know what he's doing. The second one, he shouldn't have sent it to the lab. The third one was that... Um, it, the, the, it had excess argon. Its argon hadn't escaped, and that's because the, the lava had picked up old rocks from as it was coming up through the, through the ground. Mm-hmm. It picked up old rocks, and uh, these little pieces of rock contaminated the result. And, uh, well, that's a standard 
thing, you know, and the, and the number comes out to be too old. That, that's one of the excuse, one of the uh, interpretations that's given. Okay. And um, so what happens is that Stephen Austin had, had, had looked at these under the microscope mm. for anything especially like that and there were none present. And so that was, that was one of the things. There was no, they call them xenoliths, which means foreign rocks in the, in the lava, in the samples. Mm -hmm. so, um, so he eliminated that one. He eliminated that one. He did it all in his, in his paper to start with anyway. Right. Okay. And uh, so it, it, it anticipated these sorts of objections. Yeah. And the other uh, uh, story is that, oh, that's because what happened was there was uh, the, the uh, mountain is millions of years old and the hot lava coming up from the earth, it had crystallized, and so some of the crystals were millions of years old. And so the crystals were old. It wasn't foreign rock, it was the crystals in the lava itself. And of course, uh, that's normally looked at. People, geologists, normally look at these things. Mm. They they analyze them to see that they should be uh, suitable for 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 dating. And uh, Stephen Austin looked at that and showed that that did not apply either. Mm. And so another one was that ah, oh, the extra argon is collected not in the crystals, but it's. Uh, he actually analysed the crystals and saw that there was no extra argon in those crystals, okay. you know, abnormal. And they said, oh, it was in the, in the glass. The rocks got glass with it. <laughs> and so, so you got the crystals yep. in fine glass and that's where it is. It's in there. And so uh, and uh, Stephen and I sort of also checked that and, and shown that that, uh, that was not the case in the, uh, either. So it was a very, very powerful example of a 10-year-old mm. rock giving an age of, um, from one of the crystals, the, the pyroxene, giving an age of 2.8 million years, mm. and uh, which really shows that it, it, it illustrates and I suppose exposes the problems and the difficulties and the, basically the impossibility mm. of using uh, um, modern measurements now to be able to date something in the past. Mm. Taz, I find that it's one of the biggest arguments for people, even if they don't understand what they're talking about, when they say, oh, no, I believe in evolution. God couldn't have designed the world, couldn't have made the world, or maybe even he doesn't exist. I think evolution is the reason that things are here. And the first reason they come up with is, oh, radiometric dating. Um, isn't this world, you know, millions of years old? I love it when people say carbon dating I say, uh, well, in actual fact, carbon dating gives good evidence for a young Earth, mm. <laughs> because when they say carbon dating, it means they don't know, you know, they don't know much about it. Because carbon fourteen yep. is the isotope, and it's got a very short half life, or reasonably short, five and a half thousand years, mm -hmm. and so it can't measure beyond about a hundred thousand years. So it. You know, they don't use carbon dating to prove the world is millions of years old. Mm. What, what do we do as uh, people who believe in a young Earth? Uh, we use carbon dating or ca the analysis of carbon-14 to show that it's present when it shouldn't be present. You know, these uh, that we mm. had um, uh, diamonds, which are supposed to be billion years old, yep. and there should be no carbon-14 in it and they were analysed and there was a measurable carbon-14 in it. And so it, it uh, shows that uh, indeed these diamonds, uh, there's good evidence that mm. they're not billions of years old. Mm. So we, as, as people who believe in uh, biblical creation, we don't actually say that these evidence proves that the world is young mm -hmm. because we acknowledge that you can't prove an age. Mm. Uh, but I, but we can know the age of something, and I often like to sort of tease primary age kids, and I'll say, mm. "How old are you, Sonny?" Mm. And he'll say, uh, "I'm nine. You know, I'll be in a meeting, yep. and there'll be uh, families will be there, and this little kid will be there, mm. and uh, and and I'll say, "How do you know that?" And he'll say, "It's on the calendar." Mm. And I say, "Well, how do you know that's right?" He said, Dad put it there. <laughs> and so, well, how do you know that Dad's got it right? Mm -hmm. And if Dad's, in the, or if, if Dad's in the meeting, he'll sometimes uh, 
You say, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's the historical method. Mm. And that's why, you know, as people who believe the Bible, we believe it gives an accurate history and it's got these amazing really interesting lists of names of when Adam was so many years old when mm -hmm. he begat Seth and Seth mm -hmm. was so many years old. And from that you can work out that the uh, the world is uh, only about 6,000 years old. So that's why we're always sceptical of these dates that come out in millions mm -hmm. of years of age. Mm -hmm. So radiometric dating, different to carbon dating, what do we use that for? Well, carbon dating is a form of radiometric dating, okay. but it uses but radiometric dating uses lots of different. There are lots of different uh, chemicals mm -hmm. have different vari var varieties of the elements in them. So you've got samarium, which is an element, changes into neodymium, and then you've got potassium. It decays into argon, and then you've got, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's there's lots of different ones. There's uranium, it, it, it decays into lead, and so there's dozens and dozens of different methods. And so those are the ones which you've got, they have very long half-life, you know, of millions of years. And so that, they give the ones, they give the long ages. Okay. But carbon-14's got a relatively short half-life. Right. Half-life, that's when the time it takes for for uh, half of the original isotope or the variety of element to have decayed away. And so it, that's one half-life. In the okay. next half-life, the half of that will decay away. Okay. And so there'll only be a quarter left. And in another half-life, it goes like that. They so measure it how, in those half-lives. Yes, yeah, so right. that's how they work it out. Yeah, mm. okay. And so someone could say, well, radiometric dating is giving us these millions of years, these 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 dates, how could that not be right? Mm. Mm. That's because, for exactly, that's exactly because they can only make measurements in the present and they can't go back in the past. Mm. And uh, a lot of people find that hard to, um, you know, hard to imagine that. Although I have heard a, a science program, you know, on the radio, on the ABC, where this, you know, the, this, the guy who hosts it, who's the scientist guy who hosts this program talking about radioactive dating and interviewing somebody. Mm. And he says, I think it's amazing how they do this. He says, I've got no idea how it works, <laughs> but that's amazing how they get these amazingly accurate answers. Mm. And most people have got that impression. Mm. I think it's just the radioactive radioactivity that gives an aura about it. It's the, uh, it's the nucleus of the atom you know, mm. which um, d decays away. And so it, it, we know that the, the, the half-life, it's sort of very stable. And so people just accept this narrative this mm. uh, uh, along with it, you know, this image that it has. And it's not until uh, people do get it. When you say, um, uh, for example, when you, when you yep. ask somebody, can you make scientific measurements in the past, they'll think, no, you can't, can you? Mm. You know, they, they actually think about it mm. and realise that... I'd need you, a time machine. Yeah, you, can, you don't have a time machine. No. So, well, how do you measure a date if you can't make measurements in the past? Mm. And, of course, you can't measure a date. Mm. And uh, it's a matter of, um, as the guy said, it's a matter of an interpretation. You take the results and you interpret it. There's one example of a... Um, of a fossil in, uh, in, in Africa, which they were trying to date. And uh, they, the first analysis that they did, it, they expected it to be quite young, uh, like only a couple of million years old or less than that. Yep. And uh, the first analysis came back at 200 million years. Mm -hmm. And the people that did that, the people that collected the samples and did the work, they knew that it was far too old. Mm -hmm. And so they just rejected that. So what do you do then? We well, go and collect more samples, and you do do, do 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 some more tests, and if you can't get that to be give the re right result, mm -hmm. you then start to crush the samples and pick out certain minerals, and you keep sort of doing different samples, different tests until you get an answer that fits in with what you think it should be, and that's the way it goes. But most people don't are not aware of that. They'll just say that they'll be on the TV or on yep. the radio or in the textbook that this is this amount of years mm. old, and they don't explain all the 
the uh, you know fiddling around that's mm. gone on in the past mm. to try to get that that mm. particular result. We walk around our museums. We listen to David Attenborough. We hear you know respected people talk about mm. millions of years, billions of years. That's and it's exactly just right. Mm. All we feel like we can believe when that's the story that's being told. Do scientists, have they got to a point where they now accept, well, if those dating methods are based on assumptions, then they don't work, or are they still saying they work? Uh, well, it depends. A, a, a geologists who are sending the samples off to the laboratories to be tested, yep. I've seen correspondence from them where they get very frustrated that the answers that come back just don't match what they're looking for. Okay. And uh, I've heard people, you know, I've, I've seen a discussion about a certain feature yeah. where uh, in, in, a, in, a ma in a geological members magazine mm. and uh, the, the guys say, we really need to get better dates on this. We need to send it off to the laboratory and get some more tests. Somebody writes back, well, that is what the problem is. <laughs> They're the we problem. That's why we can't dates. sort it out. Oh, yeah. It's as if pick a date, like you said. Yeah, pick a date, pick a date. That's right. Mm. What date would you like? Mm. And so we're trying to find a, a test, a sample, a test, a laboratory, a method, which gives the, the answer that we're looking for. Mm. Mm. Do, you, do you ever hear scientists get to a point where they're um, accepting maybe we haven't got this right, maybe... Maybe we're basing this on too much assumption. <laughs> I don't think so. I, 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 mm. I think they've got a certain commitment to it. Like there's been various methods in the past which have scientists have used. There was a, a helium method which they used with the isotopes of helium and they couldn't get any consistent results from that. And so that's been abandoned. Mm. And so then they, there's other methods which have come up, like I talked about potassium argon. So that was very, very much... Um, mm widely used, uh, but again, you've got the problems with they, there's, a, there's a whole story that goes about where, uh, you know, gives ages which are too old and so they say, you know, it's got argon in it and it's more argon than it should be and it's giving an older age and so they call that, there's a name they give to it called it's excess argon. Mm. So excess meaning it's older than it should be because we think the age is this mm. and so it's giving this age so that's excess argon. Mm. But the thing is all argon, it's a various isotope of argon that they're talking about, a variety, and uh, there are, you can't tell the difference. Mm. You can't, there's not a label on one which says I'm excess argon mm -hmm. and another one which says I'm not. Mm -hmm. They all look the same. So how do you know what's excess and what's not? Mm. Well, the excess is the argon that gives the, the, the too old age. Mm. So you know what the age should be and uh, mm. anything that's older than that is excess argon. Mm. So it's very, very interesting the yeah. way it works and people just don't know what's going on. Mm. And even in the scientific papers... You can read an art scientific paper and you, they present the results and you, you really have to read in detail to see just that, w what they're doing to be able to get the answer that fits with what they want, mm. you know. So mm. it's, I don't th Most well, of us probably wouldn't be able to read that and understand that and hear that like you could. Yeah, well, I don't think they're lying. I mean, anybody that's doing research work, maybe a student doing his PhD, yep. he... Um, he doesn't want to get answers which seem ridiculous. He wants to get mm. past. Mm. And so if he publishes what he gets, people will say, well, there's obviously something wrong with that. There's obviously something wrong with that. Mm. You're, not a good, uh, you're not a good experimentalist. Mm. And he fails his PhD. Mm. So he picks out the ones that fit with what he thinks it should be and, 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 and assumes that the ones that don't fit, there must be some problem with mm. them. Mm. And uh, so it's a self... Um, it's a self-censoring, so, you know, mm. a, a sort of thing that happens to make things work. Mm. Yeah. Would it feel a bit dangerous for a scientist to question some of these things in our? Well, it can be today? close. Like if you if you get a result that's different but close, mm. it's okay. Mm. But if you get a result that's a lot miles away, mm. uh, <laughs> and uh, mm. and basically, people would challenge that, even though mm. that might be where it is. And uh, and so uh, if anybody that sort of is not really game mm. to sort of push the envelope too far. Yes, mm. yeah. Just on a personal note, Taz, have you found much pushback as a geologist yourself when you talk about the things that you believe and, and look at a young earth? 
Uh, I do find it's interesting, mm. like geologists, I've been along to various geological society meetings. What do you do? I work in a publishing company. We produce uh, uh, scientific materials for families. And they say, oh, really, what's that? Oh, I produce Creation magazine. Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting and some will want to talk and okay. some will sort of then end the conversation and go somewhere else. Yeah. So, mm. you know, it's interesting being in that sort of discussion. Mm. I've been in a situation where I've given a lecture about it was in a scientific establishment and there was a really big meeting because it all blew up uh, having these Christians had me come along okay. to do a meeting there mm. and to talk about creation mm. and it just all the other scientists just went into frenzy about this should not be allowed in this establishment. Mm. So you know, the, the meeting went ahead and the r- room was packed and I, I gave a, a talk about very evidence for design, mm-hmm. am, am, amazing design yes. in living things. Yep. And I thought it was pretty good. I think the evidence for design is very powerful. Mm-hmm. Compelling. Mm. And the guy, at the, the first question was, how, uh, how old do you think the earth is? And uh, <laughs> the point being, mm. and, I, I, you know, it caught me a little bit by supply, mm-hmm. surprise. Yeah. And I said, um, I said 6,000 years. And basically, there you go. We don't have to listen to this guy anymore. He's obviously mm. cuckoo because he thinks it's 6,000 years. So I learned from that. I mm. went to a, uh, a, a, a meeting, a geological society meeting, and uh, uh, we got talking about this issue and life on Mars and stuff. And as we're coming out of the meeting, we're walking along the road and the guy said, how old do you think the Earth is? Mm. And I said, I said, well, I said, that depends. <laughs> <laughs> and I sort of yeah. occasioned a little bit rather than just saying 6,000. Yeah, yeah. And I said, um, well, it depends on how you think, you know, the earth formed. You know, if you think yeah. it formed slowly and gradually, then it would have taken a long time. Mm-hmm. But there could have been another way in which it took only a short time. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, you live yeah. and learn. Mm. It's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm. But the age of the Earth is a very, very crucial issue as far as uh, the credibility of the Bible is concerned. Mm. It clearly teaches, you know, the 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 age of the Earth. You can clearly de- determine it from from what the Bible says. Mm. So, and it's it's essential for understanding the Bible's message mm. as to why we're in the situation we're in. And uh, what God has done to, uh, to redeem us. Mm. So that's that's mm. a, a very very vital issue. Mm. I, mm. I find um, teenagers can very easily pick up an inconsistency and say, "I've had the question many times. Um, doesn't you know? Doesn't science teach us that the world is millions yeah. of years old? Um, but doesn't the Bible teach something else? They they don't need to be adults to know no, there's that's an inconsistency right. there." That's right. I, mean, I remember seeing a, an interview with Richard Dawkins where he was asked about, uh, Ben Stein asked him about his, about how things came about. Mm. You know, he's talking about design and that. And he said, well, Richard, he said, so how did it all come about? Mm. And Richard said, well, it happened very slowly, very, very, very slowly. And so he's, he's explaining as a... A naturalist, yep. as a person who doesn't believe in God, doesn't yep. believe that God created, is he's sort of putting it out there mm. that it would have happened by natural processes mm. and it would have taken a long period of time. Mm. So that's it goes to the crux of the issue. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And he's very popular. Many people listen to him and feel like he knows what he's talking about. Mm. Easy to listen and swallow it and not question it. Yep, that's right. Mm. That's right. So if I was to, I'm interested if I was to walk up to a geologist and and say, have you heard of Mount St. Helens? Would most of them yes, they know would about know, it? Yes, they would other. know about it. Yep. They would know about it. Okay. Most geologists would not see that as challenging the oh. age of the earth. Oh, how come? Because they believe it's old. Because they've got, they've got a, an implicit f- uh, faith in naturalism. Uh-huh. So and so the world must be old, and so that's not even something they question. Usually, they don't question that sort of thing. Even though we've got 
Ten year old rock. That's right. Crazy dates. Okay. And they would just say that you know they would say, well, there must be something going on that we don't really okay. know what's happening here. Okay. But they would not question it because right. that's their that's their basic belief system, mm. and they say about Christians, they say, well, <laughs> you know, you're biased. You know, you you use your, the Bible. You believe the Bible, mm. and you've got the answer. Mm. So, well, you believe in uh, mm. in naturalism, you, and so you've already assumed the answer too. You know, mm. it's not a matter of faith and science. It's mm. a matter of faith and faith. Mm. I think faiths. that's a really important distinction mm. because you mm. will hear that throwaway line that. You're not believing in science if you believe in the Bible. That's right. That's a, that's right. Mm. So, if you were to summarise the lessons we can kind of take away from Mount St Helens and what you saw there, what what would you say? Well, I'd say that the lessons of Mount St Helens are that it's it's a, a direct evidence that the dating methods, you know, uh, there's a problem with them. Mm. So, I, I think it's a, it's a clear indication that there is a problem with the dating methods. I don't think you can say that it proves the Earth mm-hmm. is young, but it, it indicates that there's a, pro, a, a big problem. And I think it, what it can do is it can liberate somebody to think, okay, I'm not, I'm not bound into absolutely having to accept something. A lot of people think you, they can't even think about the Bible because radioactive da- dating has proved the Bible's wrong. Yes. So this sort of helps to liberate people Absolutely. to think that they're allowed to think about it. Mm. I feel like it removes a big stumbling a big, block. A big roadblock, that's right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There are some other lessons from Mount St Helens mm. that are not connected directly with radioactive dating, but they do connect with the young earth. Mm. The fact that geological processes happen quickly. Okay. And, uh, for example, when the volcano erupted, it produced super hot ash which was blasted out and it produced these fine layers. Mm. And if you saw them, you know, a geologist would likely assume that each layer took a year to form and there could be many, many hundreds of years worth of layers there. Mm. And in actual fact, the whole lot, I think it was something like... um, uh, 25 feet of, of these layers was formed in one hour. What happens is that these ash or particles of uh, uh, sediment and uh, ash, they, they actually form layers automatically when they are deposited sideways, like with a, a blast of water or blast of air mm. or blast of uh, hot gas or something. Mm. Mm. So that was one lesson that layers happen quickly. Another one is that erosion happens quickly. When you go there, you can see these amazing canyons, uh, a 40th the scale of Grand Canyon, called Little Grand Canyon. And you look at it, it's got a little creek, little creek, little stream running down the middle, a wide canyon, 50 metres wide, Mm -hmm. you know, 30 metres high. And uh, so when you look at it, you think, wow, that little stream would have taken a long time to carve that canyon. But in actual fact, that that canyon was only carved in less than a day Mm -hmm. and it was due to uh, Mount St Helens subsequently erupting. The uh, hot lava melted the snow and it all came running down the side as a great big avalanche of of mud and snow and water and they piled up and then carved this valley out in a day. So there are a lot of... uh, Mount St Helens has got a lot of amazing... Uh, evidences that prove that um, mm. geology can happen quickly. And geologists have changed their thinking as a result of it. They have changed it in that they now accept that catastrophes happen, the, the impact of catastrophe on geological processes, mm-hmm. but they still won't believe that the world is young. Mm-hmm. So they think that there was a catastrophe and then millions of years and then another catastrophe and millions of years. And so they, they, they hold on to their millions of years, uh, you know, w- uh, worldview mm-hmm. like that. And one, the guy who started to write a book about this, he, he, he called it neo-catastrophism. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he documented all these examples of catastrophe. And he said, uh, he said, I'm very upset that I don't want any creationists using these evidence that I've put for... Um, Creation, mm. because I think it's totally not a not a valid science. Mm. But he's documented it all, and he said, it's like the the life of a soldier. Uh, you know, long periods of boredom punctuated with short te- periods of of terror. Mm. And so geologists have changed their thinking into mm. this neo catastrophism, this new catastrophe. Mm. So 
but they haven't changed their worldview. Mm-hmm. Taz, some people say, why does it matter if the world was made in six days by God or if you decided to create over millions of years? Yeah, well, the age of the world is important and it does matter whether God created in six days or whether it took millions of years. Mm. You see, the, the people who believe that there is no God and that the world made itself, they know that they need millions of years to be able to explain that and so they fight tooth and nail. And from the biblical worldview, we know that God created in six days a good world, but it was a result of man taking the fruit that sin and death and suffering came into the world. And you can't have death and suffering before Adam and Eve. And that's why Jesus came. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. So that's why it's vital. The age of the earth is vital. Taz, this has been amazing. Thanks so much for being with us. It's been great to have this conversation. 